Welcome to Crossroads on TVI, a show that showcases the Tamil Canadian community, their issues and their successes. I'm your host, Manjula Savaraja. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken with activists and NGOs about the recent resolution at the United Nations Human Rights Council session and about concerns around the upcoming Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Sri Lanka. Now we turn our lens to the experience of Tamil asylum seekers, specifically post-2009. We start off with the founder of an organization campaigning for the release of a family of Tamil asylum seekers, a mother and three children being held in detention in Australia. And then we will speak to an author who has been interviewing Tamil asylum seekers in London for his novel. Anthony Baniak is the founder of Letters for Ranjini, a non-for-profit, non-partisan organization that is campaigning to draw attention to the plight of Ranjini, a Tamil asylum seeker in detention in Australia. Thank you for joining us, Anthony. Thank you. It's good to be on. So perhaps you can, you know, share with our uh, with our audience Ranjini's story. Well, Ranjini came to. She, she was married in Sri Lanka. Her husband was killed in the civil wars. So her and her two sons, who would have been uh, six and eight at that point, uh, fled to Australia and they went through the normal asylum seeker process when someone arrives in Australia by boat and passed those processes, was found to be a genuine refugee, which means uh, she was found to have a genuine fear of persecution, a, a reason not to, it was unsafe for us to send her back to Sri Lanka. So she was kept in a detention centre here and then released into the community where she met an Australian man and they got married. Uh, and then about, it'll be a year ago next week, she found out she was pregnant and in the same week was called in for a meeting with the Australian government who said, uh, our spies to ASIO, which is the Australian equivalent of the FBI, have found you to be a security risk. Uh, they couldn't give her any information as to why or what she'd done to be a security risk. And as a result of that, she couldn't get a visa for Australia. Now, because she'd already been found to be a refugee, we can't send her back to Sri Lanka. So she's now, and has been for a year now, along with several others, there's about 60 people in this same situation, effectively stateless and being detained permanently um, until a third country puts their hand up to take her, which once Australia said you're too dangerous to come here is a very, very hard proposition to sell to a third country. Now, you've, so, now yeah. I've noticed in, um, in the campaigning that different parties have done in Australia, meaning in different NGOs and charities and your organization, that y you've termed this indefinite uh, detention. Can you speak to us about that term? Well, yeah, effectively, well, this, there's no trial. There's no, she hasn't been charged. She won't face a, a courtroom as such. It's just a matter of waiting until a third country takes her, which I don't think it's very rare if it's ever happened. So for these 60 people, they essentially have a life sentence. So how, um, I mean, how did you get involved in this? Uh, one of our journalists down here, a man called Michael Gordon, who's a fantastic journalist, uh, discovered Rangini's story where about two weeks after she'd been taken in to detention in May last year. So I read about the story in the paper and I had done some work with asylum seekers and refugees previously. It's been a very uh, intense political issue down here, the uh, asylum seekers, and it's ridiculous given the minuscule amount that we take. But um, So I had been involved in that. When I read Rangini's story, I just thought it was not just tragic because all asylum seeker refugee stories, are, there's an element of tragedy to it. Someone's had to leave their home, but it was so fixable and so simple. And it was just a matter of finding some people with the political will to make it happen and fit. Do you think, I mean, you brought up the, the idea of the political will. Do you think there is that political will to deal with this? I mean, you've mentioned that there are over 60 people in the same sort of situation. Yes, I think it exists, but it, it's a hard sell, I think, to, a, to the Australian community at the moment who are very... Uh, it's, a changing time so we're trying to 
I think in the sort of the week that we've had, especially with what's happened in Boston, anything with that terrorist connotation, which is what security risk does imply, it makes it very difficult. We've got an election coming up in about three, four months now in September. So it's very hard for politicians to come out and risk being attacked for releasing terrorists, which is, it's a ridiculous thing, but it's sort of the level of the debate that we have in this country at the moment is quite low when it comes to asylum seekers. Where does Fanjini state emotionally, physically? I mean, this has been quite the, I'm sure the last one year has been sort of an interesting experience. And I mean that interesting meaning a terrible experience for her. Um, yeah, she's, I speak to her husband quite regularly. Um, they are, I'd say probably as well as can be in terrible circumstances, but they're a terrifically strong family, a very, very courageous people. And they, I think they've, they've got a lot of people behind them, a lot of great support network who are helping them through this and hoping to see it resolved shortly. So what exactly does your organization do for this case? Because I think you're using this case as, a, as an example um, in order to change the state of all of these other 60 people that you've mentioned. But what are you doing specifically in Ranjani's case? Uh, so the first, like my first response with Ranjani was how terrible it would be to feel that you don't have a home or you don't have a place in the world that wants you. So we got, I just put a note out on the internet and got as many people as I could to just write a letter saying, we're sorry that you're going through this. We're sorry that our government's done this to you and we can't wait to have you back in, back in Australia and contributing to this country as she definitely will. Um, since then, so we had about 260 letters all up. There were um, events held and a lot, of, a lot of media coverage. We had a great story on CNN. So from that, we've managed to get a bit of a group together and have started targeting individual members of parliament to try to get them. Because we have a, a two-party system here, it's very easy for people to say, it's not my fault this is happening. It's bad that it's happening. It's not my fault because the party decides these things and I vote with the party. So we've tried to sort of isolate people and make them say, I'm against this. So we've got, I think, eight MPs at the moment, which is a good start, but it's out of a parliament of 150. So we've got a lot of work to do, uh, but we will keep fighting and hopefully we can see some change and some justice. Now, do you have an understanding of, or has she or her current husband shared with you what any more information on why they think she was considered a security risk? Well, they haven't been told. Well, they, it's all guesswork. They, because it could be prejudicial suspicions, ASIO can say you're a security risk. We're not telling you why. So um, there was it was released today actually in the newspaper that they. who are in a similar situation and it can be something as simple as you are, you share ideologies with the Tamil community or do you, would, you are looking for the Tamil, uh, Tamil independence and things which is sort of it's obvious and I think most of the Tamil community are in favour of that so it's hard to understand exactly what it is that's triggered this. Mm. Um, some more information has been released of late there's now a review process where they've got an independent former federal judge to go through the evidence. She'll be given access to it. So that's the first person outside of ASIO and the immigration minister who will have access to that information. But in terms of what we've got, it's very little at this stage. Interesting. Now, she has had, my understanding is she's actually had a, a child in the time that she's been in detention. Yes, in January, uh, baby Pari was born on the 16th of January, which was, especially for the new husband, or her, her current husband, sorry, it's uh, his first child. So it's, it was a very exciting time for him amidst frustrating circumstances. He wasn't, he wasn't actually allowed 
He was there for the, he was allowed for the birth when she was in hospital, but he hasn't been allowed to spend the night with the child inside the detention centre. Now, is there anything that you think, I mean, what are some of the things you think that our audience here in Canada could do? Are there ways that, that if, if oh, people that are watching find this, uh, you know, the story very compelling, which I'm sure they will, are there, is there anything that you'd ask for them to do? I think the first thing would be, and I, th I know this means a lot to Rangini, is they can go to our website, which is lettersforrangini.com, and there's a form on there to send a letter and we can pass all those on to her. And I think for her to know that it's not just Australia that are outraged by this, but it's international, I think will really lift her spirits through a difficult time. Um, if anyone out there is in media or help, wants to help tell the story, even just telling the story to family and friends, um, Australia does listen to what the rest of the world are saying, especially uh, in North America. We are... Our government do tend to listen very clearly to what the messages that come from that corner of the world. So anything you can do, it's just about telling the story and making sure the world knows that there's this injustice, there's this hole in our legal system that's being ignored and people are suffering indefinite detention as a result of it. Are there other stories that you can share of um, asylum seekers, even if they're from other countries, that are caught up? in the same sort of, um, sort of, I guess, it's almost like a black hole uh, in the system. Yes, it's, it's about 60 people, largely Tamils as well, um, which has some interesting security questions about where they're getting their intelligence from. But um, there was one, there was a brother who, or two brothers that were in there. One of them was hit in the head by a rifle butt and has suffered mental health deterioration as a result of that. And so his brother was so desperate to get adequate mental health care for, for his brother who was, he could see his brother dying of these mental uh, ailments that he'd suffered. And so it ended up attempting to take his own life just to bring attention to his brother's case. So there's these kind of tragic stories and really rough conditions that people are kept in, which it's worse than, if you kill someone in Australia, you're taken to court, you can get sentenced, you can get 25 years. If you just come here as a refugee, you don't get a trial, you don't get a sentence, it's just as long as it takes for us to find a third country, and that could be never. What would you say, you know, just as a, as a final question to you, I'm curious what sort of, you know, the average um, Australian thinks about about the situation. I mean, you've talked about political will, you've talked about the interaction that you have with politicians. What are average, you know, what's the reception that, that you're getting from average Australians, the voting public, that is? Uh, it, it depends on where you go. There are some wonderful people and we've had offers from people who are willing to do extraordinary things to help. Um, help to campaign, just wanting to send their love and apologise for the situation. Um, at the same time, there is a lot of fear of what they don't know, and that does lead into a particularly volatile debate with regards to asylum seekers, and it is such a small number here but it's so easy to politicise and there's a lot of queue jumping allegations and uh, claims of destroying passports and doing awful things to come here. We don't know who these people are, things which are ridiculous and they've been proven ridiculous time and time again, but there is a, a culture of that and it has played very well politically in the past to demonise asylum seekers. So we're working very hard to try and change that and we're hoping at this election, we'll see a much more humanitarian approach at the ballot box. Well, Anthony, it's been uh, a pleasure having you on. Remind people again what that website is that they can find out, uh, find more information about Ranjini's case. It's for Ranjini.com. Letters for Ranjini.com. Sorry, it's Letters for Ranjini.com. 
Yep. Great, and, and you're on Twitter as well, I've noticed. Wonderful. It's been a pleasure having you um, on. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And we hope um, we'll keep in touch over the next couple of months and hope that there is some movement um, at your end. Probably It'll probably be post-elections is what I'm guessing, but we do hope that there is yeah. some movement uh, when it comes to her case. Well, the case is being reviewed at the moment, so we're hoping for a positive outcome there. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. So viewers, we're going to take a break now. Stay tuned for an interview with Benjamin Dix, his second time on Crossroads. He will share the stories of some asylum seekers he has interviewed for his book. You're watching Crossroads on TVI with Manjula Salvaraja. Welcome to a special interview on TVI. Benjamin Dix was working with the United Nations and Norwegian People's Aid in the Vanni from 2004 to 2008. As the fighting between the Sri Lankan government and the LTTE escalated, he was part of the contingent that was ordered to leave the area by the Sri Lankan government in September 2008. He's currently creating a graphic novel titled The Vanni that tells the story of a Tamil family living through the horrors of that time to their life as asylum seekers. We've had him on the show before. Um, he was certainly a very popular guest then, and we are lucky to have him in the studio with us today as well. Welcome. Thank you. So what are you doing in, in our part of town or country, I would say? Um, well, I, I got invited over to, to North America, and uh, within a couple of weeks, I put together a, a tour of universities of, uh, to present the Vani project, really, as a, as a new style of telling stories of conflict mm -hmm. and migration. So I've been at Harvard, MIT, Columbia, um, Clark University, and then up here in Toronto, and visiting the community here and in Scarborough, meeting yourself. And, and presenting the book. What's the reception been so far to, to sort of the idea of the book? It's actually been quite overwhelming. I've, I've, uh, it's, it's a little bit embarrassing. I've yet to receive a major criticism of it uh, okay. or a critique of it. It's uh, in terms of the audience and especially the non-Tamil audience um, have really engaged with it. That this is a, you know, the story of Sri Lanka isn't a well-known story of the, of the conflict. People kind of know little things that went on mm -hmm. um, and by telling it as a graphic novel people really seem to be connecting with the families the human stories and the human struggles behind the conflict now what's interesting about this is that you i know you've mentioned to me before that in pulling together these stories you draw from your experience in the vanni can you i, I know that our, our our viewers were very interested last time to, to hearing about what you went through when you were going through that evacuation. Mm. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it was an incredibly painful experience. It was, I mean, the 16th of September 2008, when the day we actually drove out of Kilinochi was by far the worst day of my life. It was, you know, I had uh, I'd been there for nearly four years in the bunny. Um, I had a number of colleagues, Tamil colleagues, and many friends that I had made from my colleagues. You know, I got to know their families. I was there when their babies were born. I went to their wedding ceremonies. I ate food with them. I really enjoyed living there and making actual friends there. Mm -hmm. it, was never a, it was never really a place that I looked at it. It was just my job to be there. I enjoyed living there. Um, and as the security situation started to rise through 2008, you know, the, the fabric of the area completely changed, that you had IDPs moving up from the, from the borders mm -hmm. as the army pushed in. Um, and, you know, people started to get injured coming to the hospital, and it started to get into this kind of emergency situation. Um, and in the last couple of weeks before we evacuated, it was quite clear that the UN were going to 
evacuates that the government were going to take Kilinochi or fight for it, and they wouldn't allow you know this group of international uh, humanitarian workers to be there. So for me, that became a very personal and painful experience because I felt like I was it was my home as well, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, I had my house there yeah, and my four stuff, years and is a four long years time. is a long time, and you yeah. become part of that community. Um, and I mean, I remember two nights before we evacuated, I was panicking and I could see that my friends were going to be left behind and we were going to leave. And I remember going around to this one family's home and, and digging a hole in the night in their courtyard in the sand and reinforcing it with an oil drum and some metal and whatever and hugging this family that I'd known for four years, goodbye and good luck, and pretty much putting them in a hole and then driving away and for two years not knowing what happened to them. Mm. Um, and that, that experience is something that changes your life. You know, mm. that's an incredibly traumatic experience that you're working for an organization like the UN. Um, you have a sense that you're there to protect, that you're there to witness, and then suddenly you leave. Um, and that upset me to the core and it left me with a sense of guilt. It left me with a sense of abandonment. Um, and it was very difficult to deal with. And so I started to think, how could I actually you know, deal with that on a personal basis? And one of them was to tell the stories that haven't been told. So that's what I'm trying to do with this project. Now, uh, that's, that's very touching. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting because from an earlier conversation that, um, that you and I had, you mentioned that you know, the story initially was about the uh, the trials and tribulations of this family uh, in the Vani, and and now you're sort of moving the focus to the <laughs> asylum seeker mm. experience. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, when we last spoke la- last year, I was starting this project. So I started it about January last year in 2012, and. It was going to, I just thought, okay, I'm going to make a graphic novel. I've got all of these photographs. I've got some stories to tell. Let's tell the story. Basically, let's take, you know, one of uh, Frances's stories in her book and make it into a graphic novel. That's kind of what I was thinking at the beginning, mm-hmm. you know. And throughout the year, the project grew, the ideas grew, and, you know, the project took on a, a life of its own. And I wasn't too sure how to tell this story. So I started to interview some people that I knew from the Vani who had turned up in England as asylum seekers. And it soon became apparent that actually a lot of the stories from Sri Lanka have actually been told. Francis has done a fantastic job. Callum does his films and a fantastic job, the Channel 4 films. Mm -hmm. And those there are still many more stories to be told, but people weren't touching on the actual plight of the asylum seeker and what it's like after the bombs stop. So May 2009 was not the end of the war. People still suffer. And so I started, I wanted to look at how these kind of war can cause these rippling effects throughout families. And, you know, I mean, we see around the world, the the Tamil diaspora is huge around the world. And that's mainly due to conflict, right? The people have fled throughout the last 50 years for various reasons, to Canada, to England, to Switzerland, Um, and how that affects people's identity, that you grow up as a Canadian Tamil or a British Tamil and not a Sri Lankan Tamil, right? Mm. So, but the period that people are going through now in, in 2012 and 2013 is very different to the people who fled in the 1980s when asylum was more liberal, that people were welcomed into places like Canada a lot easier than they are now in 2013. The borders borders are different than they were back then. Mm -hmm. So as I started to interview uh, people in in London, I mean, at the moment, I'll tell you this one story. I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing at the moment a whole chapter on torture. So Anthony, the character in the book, is is a product of many testimonies that I'm taking, right? So he lives out these testimonies. And there'll be a period after the conflict where he is tortured from Manic Farms. And these are the testimonies I'm taking. So this one guy, he was 29 years old, and I met him in London, and I, and I interviewed him about his experience being tortured. And he sat there and he looked me in the eye and told me for about two hours 
this extreme story of being tortured for six weeks, locked in a dark room and being tortured, and, you know, manner of violence that is hard to talk about. But he spoke to me in a real matter of fact. He didn't cry. He didn't even shake. He just told me the story. Then he got onto the story about what it's like to be here in England as an asylum seeker. And every week he has to go to an office to sign on as the asylum seeker to re uh, also receive his weekly allowance to live. But one week he went to sign on and his asylum had been refused. So the UK border agency grab him there and take him to Heathrow Airport to detain him and send him back to Sri Lanka. He understands if he goes back to Sri Lanka, he'll be tortured and killed. So he went to hang himself at the detention centre because that's the easier way is to die here in Heathrow than face torture again back in Sri Lanka. So he hung himself, but he didn't kill himself. He just twisted his spine. So he goes to hospital for two weeks. He's now back in the, uh, in the process of asylum uh, through appeal. Every week he has to go and sign on thinking today I might be grabbed again is, and yeah. tonight I might have to commit suicide again. Mm -hmm. He's been going through that period for two years. So for those two, and that's when he started to cry when he was telling me this story, not the torture story, because this was the mental torture. And as I was listening to this, I was realizing actually that this process is a story that really hasn't been told. And it's, it's such a powerful story. And it's, it's actually what it does now is it opens it up that it's not just about Sri Lankan Tamils. This is about Somalis or Afghans say, or Pakistanis or Burmans. This is the Burmans. asylum seeker experience. Exactly. Yeah. And what I hoped, and so my story, has, the, the, the Vani project hasn't changed in the fact that it is a story about Sri Lankan Tamils. It's based in the Vani and the experiences afterwards. But I wanted to make it a more general story about forced migration, what happens at the end of a war. Mm -hmm. When families are ripped apart, when you have to go through this asylum process, you deal with racism, you deal with identity, and you deal with the unknown future that you might be sent back if you're not successful. Mm -hmm. And that experience is something that I wanted to tell. And, I mean, when you, when, how are these, I mean, what is the, I'm trying to imagine uh, approaching these people and talking to them, right? How do you, how, what state do you find them in, the asylum seekers themselves? Because it sounds like you've actually spoken to quite a few mm. in, in London, mm. right? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm doing, I'm actually doing a PhD in anthropology behind this book. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do that so that I could get the, the methodology and the ethics set in a solid framework mm -hmm. to be able to produce this book, okay? So I didn't want to just roll into people's lives and start interviewing them about very, very sensitive issues. I wanted to really try and work out the best ways of, of doing this. So I work with asylum seekers. I'm not going to say the organization, but I work with asylum seekers who are uh, interacting with their therapists. So people who, have, who are uh, receiving some form of therapy, okay, uh, physical and mental. Um, and so the interviews that take place are in that space and with, with their therapist. Meaning they have their therapist right there. They have their therapist them. there, yeah. So it's, you know, I don't interview them in a coffee shop or even in their home where at the end of the interview I say thank you very much and leave. And, and they're and, left with this uh, trauma, yeah, exactly, reliving this trauma. Exactly. I, we do it in a space in, where they're comfortable, where it's a new, neutral space where they can then, at the end of the interview, sit with their therapist and, and decompress this stuff. I also then go to a therapist and decompress to a therapist, which is part of the ethical issues with my PhD that the university wanted me to have. So I don't build it all up and, and it becomes blurred for me. I can decompress. That's interesting. So it's a whole process of kind of uploading, working with the material and downloading. Um, and it's incredibly traumatic, sometimes cathartic, but kind of in, thoroughly enjoyable in a strange way. Like it, it's, it's telling people stories. And by doing this, the, the kind of interesting thing that I'm trying to do is uh, that you'll, you'll see from the picture, the, the graph, is I'll take the testimonies of three people per chapter, then turn those testimonies into a narrative 
that is played out by this family in the book. We then do the pencil sketches, and then I take those pencil sketches of the chapter back to those three Tamil respondents, and they edit it. So It's by, very collaborative. Yeah. So by doing that, I'm directing the whole book, but I'm giving them a space to edit and say, actually, like... I would never have said this to my wife in this situation or this is how my children would have acted in this situation, you know, because they're seeing their story fictionalized and illustrated. And so then they have a space to edit it all. And that's that's the really interesting kind of ethnographic piece. You know? This gets more interesting and you're going to stick around. We're going to take a break right now. We're talking to Benjamin Dixie. This is uh, very interesting. Uh, we'll be back in uh, a couple of minutes. You're watching Crossroads on TVI. Welcome back to Crosswords on TVI. We're speaking to Benjamin Dix, who's, um, it's fun because we have you in the studio. It's mm -hmm. always nice to have the Skype guest from another country <laughs> in here. So I'm actually going to ask you this, even though it's completely out of context. I know that I made the mistake of calling you Dixie because I heard a couple of people that you came in with in the lobby calling you that. Why Dixie? Is that uh, just a British thing to kind of IE everything? No, no, not at all. It's, a, it's the nickname of my, my grandfather, my uh, papa. Uh, who was an artillery gunner in the Second World War. Mm. And when you were in the Second World War, if your surname was Smith, you became Smithy. If you were Jones, you became Jonesy. He was Dix and he became Dixie. Dixie. And Apapa was a, a big hero of mine and, and he died when I was 12 and I became Dixie. Ah, okay. Well, <laughs> at least I've cleared my curiosity yeah. on that. So how far into the book are you right now? Uh... I can answer that in two ways. I'm writing chapter three. Okay. Uh, and Lindsay has just finished uh, penciling chapter one. And he's your co-creator. He's right? the yeah. He's the artist mm -hmm. and the co-creator. Uh, so he, you know, the the writing after I interview people and then triangulate these three interviews into the script and write the script for a chapter that takes me about six weeks. It then takes Lindsay about two and a half months to draw it, yes. because it. You, I mean, you've seen the illustrations, it's and it's beautiful. all hand drawn. And I mean, yeah. he's a real pure artist that won't use Photoshop or any of it. It's just pen and paper, you know. So um, he's always that long way behind. So I can write two scripts ahead of him, two chapters ahead of him, and then come round and, and do tours of North America and leave him in London <laughs> catching up. Sleeping away. Okay. <laughs> exactly. So now the other interesting thing that I noticed is that, you know, when you first spoke to us, there was this idea of this graphic novel. And it seems like the project, it's actually become a larger project now. So talk to us about what's happened and, and why. Um, well, I always, everything that I've worked on, I've always tried to push it get it bigger and bigger and better and better. And, and there's been such positive feedback about this project from within and without, outside the Tamil community. People seem to like it. They're, they're engaged with the story. And so, again, last year, as I was kind of conceptualizing the, the book um, and thinking about how to run with it, I always had in my mind it was a book and it would be a published book that would be on your bookshelf as a, as a history of the Sri Lankan conflict and migration. And then I set up the website and we started to look at how we could play with this as an interactive website. And, and you've seen you can, on the website, you can click behind the illustrations, there are photographs and there are film clips and, and it kind of sits between fiction and non-fiction. Um, and since I've been touring around universities in England and, and uh, North America, it suddenly is becoming apparent that actually this could be a really interesting educational tool. That 
on the website, it sits, uh, you know, students or interested people can, can read it as a graphic novel, as an illustrated story. But behind the illustrations, when we deal with uh, asylum, for example, and Anthony is in London going through the asylum process, behind those illustrations, we can have uh, a journalistic uh, uh, article from a newspaper about asylum. We can have academic articles about asylum legislation and law and issues like this. And it becomes a kind of gateway for people to be introduced to the, the academic arguments behind the graphic novel, right? What a great way to learn. Yeah. Can you imagine being, that's that's a fabulous way if you're a college or a university student to actually take in that material well, I, using the, the graphic yeah, interface. Well, it yeah. seems to be the way. So uh, on Wednesday last week, I, I gave a talk at uh, Waterloo University here at their Peace and Conflict Studies. And the students loved the idea because it would it would sit on their reading list that they would go to the library and they would read a graphic novel. But then there would be all these issues within the, the story of the Vani from you know, the beach and the, the counterinsurgency between the tigers and the government, the manic farms and all the issues that happened there, the torture, IDP related the issues. IDP mm -hmm. related, then the forced migration, then how Anthony came to England with agents illegally on document, on the legal document, uh, false documentation, all this kind of stuff, and then asylum. So there's all these kind of areas within the story that students could interact with. And on the website, it, you know, again, it's me doing a PhD that I'm reading all of this material and then I just add it to the website behind it. Um, and so it gives you avenues to explore all of these things. And then I started to think last two weeks ago, I was at MIT and gave a presentation there. And that made me afterwards, I had this idea of which I've now termed meanwhile. Okay. So the idea there is that in the book, you're reading about Anthony in London having an issue with his asylum. Then it goes, meanwhile, and you see our Prime Minister and our Home Secretary in the Houses of Parliament, illustrated, discussing asylum legislation. And therefore, we get this idea of how these kind of global issues and national issues of politics affect the human on the street. This one man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, you've got Anthony's family on the beach in in uh, in Mulativu in the conflict in no fire in the no fire zone. Meanwhile, you see the General Assembly in New York with Ban Ki Moon and China and Iran and the UK discussing Sri Lanka and how those discussions in New York affect Anthony and his family on the beach. And if we can do something interesting with the, with the internet side, with the website, it could be that students have a way of um, uh, kind of manipulating those meanwhile aspects and see how and life see, plays out. Yeah, yeah. Right? So you get these kind of simulated uh, educational experiences. I mean, imagine uh, for anyone sort of students researching uh, migration policies mm or even peace and conflict studies, like you mentioned, that, that's an amazing exercise. Mm. So you should stop touring, basically, because the project's going to completely <laughs> grow beyond. Yeah, I know. You'll be working on this for like 100 yeah. years. Um, talk to me about putting your PhD around this, because that's, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, so that kind of started at the same time. I, I, I finished my master's, I started working on the book, and then Sussex offered me a unique PhD where 50% of the PhD is the finished book, and the other 50% is the is a thesis on the methodologies, ethics, and research about the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got to go back to Sussex next week and told, tell them that now I'm thinking educational <laughs> programs and all this meanwhile aspects, and so it's, it's growing, and my supervisors are going to have to sit me down and say, you know, slow down. <laughs> but whatever, push it, you know, make it big. Yeah. And... Um, uh, really, the PhD aspects to me are about the ethics, and and it's about really respecting the vulnerability of these stories, and that's yeah. something that I just want to be very, very careful about. And by doing it as a PhD, I have to constantly reinforce, reinforce, and challenge the decisions that I'm making in the book, and defend those decisions in the thesis. Uh, 
Okay. And that's really important. So when I change the gender of a character in the book, I, don't, I can't just change the gender of a cartoon character. I have to defend that in the thesis. Why was it important to change that girl to a boy or vice versa, right? Um, and then the reception that I get, the, the way I interview people, um, the, the, the asylum seekers in London, sitting with their therapists, allowing them to edit the script after we've written it so it gives them the story. Um, you know, I'm very aware that, okay, I did live in the Vani for four years and I worked in the UN and I, I know the Vani very well, but I left in September 2008. I'm not an asylum seeker. I'm not Tamil. I didn't protect my children or my wife or go through any of those experiences, but I'm in a position of being who I am to be able to write and direct this book. But being in that position, I want to give the, the, the asylum seekers a space to be able to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. And the PhD allows me to kind of build that methodology. Around it, that's, that's phenomenal. Yeah. So how, what, how, how are you funding this? I mean, what kind of support are you looking for? I'm sure <laughs> there are gonna be people that'll be calling in here to say, you know, we love this. You know, mm. how can we support this gentleman in his work? Yeah, I mean, that's the, the funding is always the hard thing with these kind of projects, you mm -hmm. know? Like, if I had unlimited funding, I want to make a film, an animated film of this. I want to do this whole educational thing. It's, you know, the funding's the problem. Unfortunately, I think because it's politically sensitive, it's quite new and innovative, so people and organisations have been a bit cautious about funding. We, we're actually now really running out of money and Lindsay, the artist, and I have been self-funding this for the last year and a half. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's taken a toll on our, mm. on our, on our own personal savings. Um, and we're at a point now where we really need funding. So, yeah, I ask if, if you would like to be involved, if you would like to help us create the rest of this book, then through the website, um, you, you can go onto PayPal and you can donate money. And you to may the as book. well share the the uh, the, the website. The website yeah. is uh, thevani.co.uk, mm -hmm. um, and on there there's a PayPal link which you can you can donate money to. Um, and I've I ethically won't take money from organisations because I need to keep the book impartial and and free to be able to tell testimonial stories. So, but I'm, I will take, uh, you know, donations from individuals, individuals. And, and, and that's great. And that's really helpful. Also, the other way you can support is by telling me your stories. If you have interesting uh, asylum stories or stories of fleeing the conflict, please write to me and tell me these stories and I'll try and follow up with Skype interviews or these kind of things as well. Interesting. So my uh, last question for you is uh, with regards to those families that you uh, moved around with, in the Vani, four years. I mean, you probably developed a family there yourself, mm, right? Mm. I mean, how are they doing? Have you connected with people there? Um, with people who are in Sri Lanka now? Yeah, that you left behind. Yeah. Like some of the, have you managed to find them or reconnect yeah, with some, them? Some. I mean, I, I lost over 30 friends in, in the conflict um, uh, after we left. And you know, in 2008, I had a spreadsheet of, of 100 odd names of people that you know, I, I knew and we left behind and, and slowly through the last few years I've put ticks or crosses or question marks next to those names. Some of them are in the UK, some in Canada, some in Switzerland, some died and some are still back in Sri Lanka. Um, the government of Sri Lanka aren't my biggest fans and therefore I am very sensitive about how I communicate with my friends in Sri Lanka. I don't want to leave a footprint there. None of my research is done with people in Sri Lanka now. Uh, it's all people who are outside, so I'm I'm just very careful about. You're being that. very careful yeah. about which which and, makes and sense. And with the photographs that appear in the book, you know the the faces are blurred, or we illustrate the faces so that you know there there can't be any reprisals to people who are still there or their families. Interesting. Well, thank you so much for this. Has been such a pleasure. Hmm, thank and you. we you know we want to follow this. We want to see where it goes, and and we can't wait to to see the first chapter out there so we can crack it open. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for coming into the studio and uh, I'm sure we're going to see him again. Right? Thanks so And much. good luck with the book. Cheers. Thanks. You've been watching a special interview with Benjamin Dix um, on Crossroads on TVI. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>